New business item number one. Don? Uh, consider a recommendation to the City Council to revise the adopted electric service standard to require developers to install LED street light fixtures and aluminum street light poles in new developments. Uh, in the 1990s, the city received a uh, refund from the uh, Western Area Power Association, also known as WAPA, as an incentive to replace uh, mercury vapor street light fixtures uh, from high pressure sodium to uh, LEDs. Uh, then in, uh, since 2013, uh, funds have been included, including the electric uh, fund budget to buy LEDs and replace them uh, and replace the uh, sodium vapor uh, fixtures. <clears throat> also in the past, the city of Garner Electric Division was responsible for purchasing and installing street light infrastructure and was utilizing fiberglass uh, poles. In 2009, the Garner Public Works Engineering Division required the developer responsible for purchasing, purchasing and installing street lights within the platted subdivision to use aluminum poles. The city did not have a standard at this time. So they use a standard that was being that was being used by Johnson County area cities. <clears throat> For our adopted electric service standard, May 2013, Section uh, I-124, General Information, it states the developer is responsible for installing street light, lighting system within a platted subdivision or commercial development. Contact the City of Garner Public Works Engineering Division at 913-856-0959 for additional information. So we like to revise the standard. Uh, it will save the city uh, energy costs and eliminate the need to convert high pressure sodium fixtures to LEDs. Uh, the proposed uh, revision will make minimal changes to the standard. Uh, it will state that developer is responsible for installing the street light lighting system utilizing LED street light fixtures and pertinent material and aluminum street light poles within a platted subdivision or commercial development. Contact the City of Garner Utilities Department at 913-856-0980 for additional information. So we recommend uh, approve a recommendation to the City Council to revise the adopted electric service standard to require developers to install LED street light fixtures and aluminum poles in new developments. Right. So this standard isn't, is this published somewhere so a developer would know what they have to provide? There's a electric standard, there's a, there's a book we have and that's part of the... Uh, it's, it's not in there, that's why we want to get it in there. Right now, you know, a lot of subdivisions are, you know, second phase and they're finishing out third and fourth phases. And what happened was when the, you know, the engineering department here at City Hall took over and we stopped putting in the street light poles, they just kind of went with everybody else's standards, Sublin Park, Old Lake, and everything on the aluminum poles and started moving all that into the system. So. Now everybody's all used to that, so and we want to make that a standard now. Instead of you know using aluminum poles, if you, know, if you have aluminum, then you got you know fiberglass, it's a big mix and subdivision. So we just want to make it standardized that just use aluminum poles. Is there, is there not some um, document that when they get uh, inspected and approved that they actually have to this? I don't know, this seems like it's kind of a informational pamphlet type of language to me because you call for additional information. I don't know. That's why I'm curious about well, it. Is it something that, I mean, they they get and they sign that they're going to actually well, install these? Well, additional information is, is like uh, what kind of poles they're going to use, what kind of, you know, street light heads. If it's a major thoroughfare, they got to use a cobra head. If it's uh, back in the subdivision, we'll have to use a post type luminaire. It's all in the we have a, like a, not like a standard, we got like a standard, like a spectrum <coughs> that what they can use, we want to get that, get that in there later on. 
So they would get this up front, but I, I think you, you're both that kind of asking what happens later on. Let's say they missed this or it was informational and they, they glossed over it or they called and didn't get an answer and didn't call back. How do we, is there anything that guarantees that they actually, is there a checkbox somewhere that says you did use aluminum or would there be in the future? Yeah, that would be over with the engineering department. Mark Pottinger, he makes sure that they use aluminum poles and all that stuff. But he was just talking to me and he said, we need to make a standard this. So, so I had somebody call like a couple weeks ago and they were finishing out a subdivision and going, well, part of the subdivision's got aluminum poles from way back when. He goes, can I use aluminum poles? I mean, fiberglass poles. I go, well, engineering department, they've been, you know, last few years they've been using aluminum poles. So there was really nothing to, to tell this guy, no, we need to use aluminum poles. So right now, if somebody came in, they could do either. And there's yeah, nothing that says you can't do it. Yeah, we don't have a standard that says no yet. But, if, but this would force them so that engineering would now say... We have something to stand on now. They could point back to this. Yeah. This is in our standards. We have to use aluminum poles. I'm going gonna, gonna to back this up seven years, I guess. Why did we change it where the developer had to provide the pole and light fixture? That, I don't know. <coughs> That's probably when when the electric, we used to put in all the infrastructure. We used to put in the conduit, the wire, the electric department, and the street lighting system. But it just got out of hand. We couldn't keep up with it anymore. So and that's when we started making the developers put in their own. Was that an arbitrary number? Seven? Well, it said 2009. Well, so that's about when, that's I mean, about when the public works engineering department kind of took over. Well, and that was right our after all of our building projects fell off a cliff and we didn't have any more. Yeah. So I'm wondering if it was to cut costs on the city. Yeah. I'm just yeah. guessing here. I mean, from a developer point of view, they have to provide a pole and a light fixture that meets your standard that they don't have any. They have to provide, um, it was a Streetworks brand LED fixture, I think, that we, it was like back yeah. in December or January. Yeah. They have to provide that specific model number with this specific pole. Yeah. And so the developer can't, they don't have any equals that they can send out for bid. We have, they can do, there's other ones that I have in the standard, not the standard, but my spec sheets. There's other lights that I got mentioned in there too. Okay. Other than the street work. And I got Valmont, Lumen street light poles, and I got Hapco. So I've given them either option and either one of them all the big companies, they use either one of them. They were the main two everybody uses. Okay. So I have them in there, so. I just haven't seen one. this. I haven't seen the standard. I just remember when these went out to bid last time, it was three different suppliers providing a specific Streetworks yeah. model number. Yeah, the Cooper Light. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I have another another one in there. That's why I say get all of me, and I'll send them what they need. But then we go we go back out and replace the bulbs in them. I know it's with the LEDs LED. they last for a Later long time, on, but, yeah, but, the initial but they're all standardized. Yeah. I, I don't know how the are all the light pole lights actually LED, LED. Yeah. actually standardized. Yeah. Oh. So the developer installs them. The city then owns and maintains. Yeah. And provides power. To them. But they're but they're not going to be installing something that <coughs> we can't. We have to go out and make a special purchase to replace that particular. No, as long as they put up an LED head, then we're good. Then we're all. good. I just want to get, you know, street light full with aluminum. They're just much more easier to take care of. I mean, somebody hits them like a fiberglass pole. I mean, they get dingy. They start leaning. People hit them. They break off. You got to call and locate. You got to dig up around them so you can pull the wire out, and you got to put a strap on there. Sometimes two or three times to try to suck it out of the ground. You know, aluminum poles are they're anchor base. They have an anchor base, and they have four four nuts on them. They have a breakaway base. They break over. You undo your your nuts. Set the pole back on here. Do that. 
You might call and locate or anything like that. Everything is fiberglass. Is just, it's just hanging in the back. Plug and play. Okay. But, yeah. I mean, the, the standard isn't published on our website or anything? No. Okay. That's why I want to get it. The actual standards oh, we have, the 2013. Yeah, yeah, they're on the list. Yeah. Okay, so a developer has easy access. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I do have another question. I know our numbers probably don't change much, but we changed the phone number. Is that something that ever, is that just switching departments or something? Or? Yeah, the, fir the, uh, the first one was the, uh, the old uh, public works, and the, uh, the one on the bottom is the new uh, utilities department number. But it doesn't it doesn't happen very often enough to take it out and maybe make it a little bit more generic. That we don't have like a switchboard around here or something. Nope, we don't. Okay. Well, from, from what I gathered, <coughs> we would be putting in writing what we we're already doing. So we don't expect it really any backlash from developers. No, they're all they're just, they're doing what they're used to. They're used to aluminum and that. Well, we're just cleaning up the paperwork, so that's something. It's more of a housekeeping item. Yep. Make a motion to approve a recommendation to the City Council to revise the adopted electrical service standards to require developers to install LED streetlight fixtures and aluminum poles in new development. Second. I have a motion by Waldman, a second by Learned. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimous. Business item number two. Proceed a recommendation to City Council to award a service contract for the 2016 Hillsdale Water Treatment Plant Pond Cleanout Project. Uh, <clears throat> the city operates the Hillsdale Water Treatment Plant, and uh, the plant has two large uh, ponds. It also has a small one as well. So during the, um, you have uh, seven media filters that they clean the water before they're, they go to storage. After so many hours of filtering, you have to do a backwash and clean the filters to remove the sediments. So that water is transferred to one of the two ponds. So what is usually done, we use one and transfer all the back, um, uh, back the, the flush back flush from 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 the filters to one pond. When it gets full, then we start using the second one. So when it gets full, we need to get a contractor to remove the sediments. Uh, over the past year, we've been doing this. You have to do it every year. You know, we clean one of the two ponds a year. So we've been bidding every year to do this work. So this year, we uh, uh, the bid uh, was for a four-year contract. Um, going back to the to the actual uh, agenda item, the bid request was published in the Gardner's, Gardner News on July 7, 2016, and posted on the city website. In addition, notices were sent to the past bidders. On July 22, 2016, bids were received from three firms. Bid results were Midwest Injection, installed price was 49,900, Walters Excavating LLC, 53,300, 53, and NutriJet, 73,964. In the past, Walters was the contractor that was usually get, got the bid, but this year uh, the lowest bid was Midwest Injection. Um, they usually do work for uh, Johnson County Wastewater and also for uh, Century, um, Century Airport. We reviewed the bid and we feel confident that in their bid and their ability to perform the work. <clears throat> so we have $50,000, and we're 
way uh, within the uh, $50,000 budget amount for the sludge removal. So I'd like to recommend the City Council to award a, uh, a contract to the low bid Midwest injection in the amount of 49900 for that 2016 Hillsdale water treatment uh, pond cleanout. And like I say, it will be a four-year contract. It will be renewed every year. They have to man re maintain the same price. And if, if they want to increase it, they, they have to send a notice to the director uh, justifying the increase. Questions, comments? What does it say this is a four-year? I didn't see that in there. Yeah, it's, it's not, but I, um, in the actual uh, uh, bid uh, package or information, it sa states it's for a full year. It's until December 31st. And the contract, because this is just a bid form, so. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I need to clarify that for when I present it to the city council. It, it probably wouldn't hurt. In a motion. Make a motion to approve a recommendation to the City Council to award a contract of low bidder Midwest injection incorporated in the amount of $49,900 for the 2016 Hillsdale WTP pond cleanup. Second. Motion, Waldman, second, learned. Any further discussion? No. Nope. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Business item number three. <coughs> uh, consider recommendation to the City Council to award a supply contract for replacement of two submersible pumps at the, as part of the Rural Water Pump Project, CFP Project WA-1602. The, the Hillsdale Water Treatment Plant was re originally built in 1998 with a capacity of 2 million gallons per day. It was expanded to 4 million gallons per day in 2006. Uh, uh, and also have the accommodation to further expansion to 6 million gallons per day, although I think that's a little doubtful now. Um, the, the city currently receives all the water from Hillsdale Lake. The intake is about 2.5 miles from the uh, water treatment plant. Uh, we have three um, 125 horsepower pumps, submersible pumps. They are Furbanks Moore's uh, uh, brand. <clears throat> uh, two pumps were installed in 1998 during the, uh, the original uh, build of the plant, and in 2006, the third pump was added. Last year, in the 2015 water utility assessment, uh, it was identified that the pumps had reached their expected life and they recommended replacing or rebuilding the pumps. Uh, usually for the past couple of years, every summer during our high speed, usually one of the pumps go out. Uh, and <clears throat> making it uh, at times uh, uh, very hard to, uh, to treat the water since, since we don't have enough capacity. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, new reliable pumps uh, is needed to ensure an un an interrupted supply of raw water to our treatment plant. The assessment also recommended installing variable speed drives on the uh, raw water pumps to allow a continuous flow to the uh, water treatment plant. When you have any any um, a surge or an in, uh, a sudden increase in water flow, it will disrupt the chemistry in the water treatment. So. Um, the best way is to have a constant flow, and a variable speed drive will help accommodate that. The, uh, the raw water pump project is uh, divided in three components. The replacement of the uh, submersible water pumps, the installation of the variable speed drives, a uh, water level indication, and a hoist upgrade. Uh, the target completion for the project is late fall of 2016. Uh, 
The estimated project costs are the raw water pump replacement, $135,000. That includes $100,000 for replacing uh, three pumps. Uh, the installation is about $35,000. In the variable speed drive, we budget $160,000. This includes three variable speed drives, the engineering to install the variable drives, and installation and miscellaneous. <clears throat> then the uh, current intake uh, structure doesn't have any water level indication. So if for some reason the level goes down, we will not be aware that there's a problem. So part of the uh, project is to install level indication to alert the operator so he can take some action. And the, la the last one is a ho hoist upgrade. We have a existing hoist that is over 20 years old. It's not, uh, in, uh, good, uh, it's not operational right now, so we need to upgrade the ho hoist. In case we need to pull the uh, submersible pumps, the hoist will be av available. And then we have a contingency of $235,000 for a total of $610,000 for the project. Uh, staff recommends replacing the existing raw water pumps with Furbanks Moore's equipment with the same model pump to minimize any structural modifications to the uh, existing intake. Due to the 12-week uh, lead time and to complete the project by the target date, uh, staff requested a proposal from DXP Super Center. Uh, they are the distributor for Fairbanks Moore's pumps in the states of in the state of Kansas, and it's a single source. Uh, they are the only ones that will that can sell you the pump here in Kansas. So we received a proposal, and we recommend awarding the supply contract to DXP in the amount of eighty-eight thousand dollars, eighty-eight twenty-eight thousand. $26 for replacement of two submersible pumps. Um, so the entire project 610 estimated. And we're just looking at the $100,000 for the pumps. But the project talks about all three pumps, and we're replacing these two. Are we thinking about rebuilding the third one that's 10 years old now? What happened? About around May, June this year, the uh, number three pump failed. So we had to send it out to Fairbanks and more for, for, for rebuild. So that's basically a new pump, basically. So what, right now we need to replace two. Like I said, usually the pumps break during the uh, starting of the summer for some reason. So right now we'll be replacing actually two pumps. And it's a single source since they are the only ones, uh, DXP is the uh, distributor of Fairbanks and more. So I assume then that we'll, we'll have more business items between now and when the pumps come in to handle the rest of these items? Yeah, we have a consultant, PEC. They are doing the uh, water master plan. So they'll be giving us uh, specifications for the uh, variable speed drive, the... Uh, water level indicators, and also the, uh, the uh, specs for the, for the engineering to install the variable speed drives. Now the, ver the variable speed drives, those are there, is that in case we lose a pump and kick the other two up? Is that the, the variable speed drive basically is a uh, electronic device that will uh, cause the, the motor to um, it will regulate the speed of the, of the motor. So it will regulate the speed of the pump. So if you need more water, you will send an electrical signal to the motor and it will speed up or slow down and that will give you more or less water. Traditional, you use a uh, control valve to do this. But that has some, um, uh, you will lose the efficiency of the pump. So it is best if, 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 we, uh, if we have the, uh, the means uh, economically to put a variable speed drive. So 
to, you know, if you have a pump, you can regulate by opening and closing a valve. Okay, so right now if we lose a pump, we have to open another valve on the other two pumps, is that what? That's right, and we, they're manual, so somebody has to go to open the valve. And like I mentioned, what you want is a constant flow. Yeah. So you can regulate with a variable speed drive, you can regulate all three pumps to give you the required amount of uh, water. And many years ago, the variable speed drive, the cost was prohibited, but nowadays they're fairly reasonable. Does that tie in with the skater system? That will be tie in with the skater system. What, what's the contingency? Originally, the project that we were thinking of putting a vertical pump, and it was to get a vertical pump, uh, the cost is pretty, you're talking about $150,000, $200,000 per pump and motor. So after reviewing the operation of the raw water pumps, uh, we uh, decided to stay with the same style of pump instead of putting a vertical pump. So that's why the increase, that's, that's why originally the price was $610,000. Okay, so the contingency is not going to be used. I, I don't think so. Assuming we don't have any problems. Right, the whole project will be done for less than uh, $250,000. Motion to approve a recommendation to the City Council to award a supply contract to DXP Supercenter in the amount of $88,026 for replacement of two raw water pumps as part of the raw water pump project, CIP project number WA1602. Second. Motion learned. Second, Waldman. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Discussion items. We'll start with electric distribution. Bruce, can you give us an update on yeah. what we've done last, last month? Uh, right now, the service crew, they're working on the 600 block of East County. They're rebuilding a section of single phase overhead line over there. They're kind of doing that in between their, you know, daily duties, you know, services, trouble calls and all that. And the other crew, they're out there at uh, Parma, and we got like about a thousand foot more to bore the conduit, the four inch conduit, and all the boring will be done. So hopefully within two weeks, all the conduit, most of the conduit around there, other than a few little bores, will be like that. And after that, they'll be pouring wire and do some switch over, but it's, it's going pretty good. And uh, the people in the area are still pretty receptive? Everybody's pretty good. Had, a, had one issue on the uh, street that was, but uh, we had some poison ivy back there. So we sprayed some sprayed the poison ivy on the ground, and it killed, an old, and it killed a couple of mulberry trees that kind of uh, separate Parma and Genesis back here. So uh, this person back here was saying, you know, because we took the tree out because we thought the lady on the farm was I went and talked to her and she goes, well, I don't like that mulberry tree anyway. And I always have to <laughs> mow around it and they're always crapping on my car. Can you remove it? So I said, yeah, I can remove it. It's, it's in our easement anyway. So we, had one. so we removed it. But the guy behind called and said, I like that blockage, you know, because I didn't have to see the neighbors in the back. So, and I told him, I said, you know, when we get the line out of there and get that cleaned out and fall comes. I mean, we got a few little, we got some money in the tree budget, you know. Can we put a couple little trees back there? And he was real happy about it. So that's about the only issue we've had. So, you know, to keep the guys from getting real bad poison ivy, we put some stuff on the ground, but it took over that mulberry tree and just turned it Well, it sounds like it was probably going to come out at some point with tree trimming anyway. If it, it was going to get, it got trimmed all the time anyway. Like an old mulberry tree and some bushes back there and poison ivy and so 
but it blocks somebody's view of the neighbor. So that's about the only issue we've had so far. So that's about it. But it's it's going pretty good. Right? Yeah, we got through the park, so all the conduits mainly through the park. We got one little more. We got to come through the park in single phase, but but it's going pretty good. That's all done. So we're out of the way there. They can start their, their new addition on these fields. This water division. Oh, that was the Well, you, you, since you were involved with that one, if you can give them your your uh, comments on what happened there. Where's that? Well, the wastewater door. I'll give you a background. Back in March of this year, during the uh, Waverly Road expansion, the, con the uh, contractor went ahead and cut our fiber optic cable. And the fiber optic is used to send the wastewater from the city to Edgerton. So uh, we met with the uh, contractor and said, hey, I called Locate and they couldn't, I was not aware we had a fiber cable. So we had to uh, uh, install a, replace a 9,000 feet of cable. So thanks to uh, Bruce and his, and his guys, we were able to do it ourselves. So the uh, electric distribution, these are boring. To, uh, there, there's a section that we couldn't uh, uh, put a, we couldn't use the existing conduit because it was cut during the during the expansion. So they did some directional boring and installed a conduit. And then Scott uh, Milholland, and also with the help of Bruce uh, guys, we pulled the uh, 9,000 feet of fiber optic. So you can see there, you know, the, uh, Scott calls it a Seven horsepower, electric and wastewater personnel. Why did we end up with nine thousand feet? It's about um, a mile and a quarter. So originally, the fiber that was installed is only for a couple hundred. So we had the wrong, the wrong fiber. So the uh, fiber uh, specialist recommended putting a, a new fiber. Mm -hmm. So we had to do the whole nine thousand feet. Bridge. Are, are locate sources able to actually pick up fiber underground? They have to put the, the fiber needs to have some tra trace. But anyway, apparently when we on a uh, monthly basis or quarterly basis, we update our utilities and it's, that is sent to the uh, locate company. But apparently that information was not passed so when he was trying to locate the sewer and everything else, he was not aware of the fiber. So, but we had provided the information? To the, that's what Public Works Engineering told me, we have. But when I talked with the locate person, he said, I, I really don't have that information. I pulled to a metal pipe, to a metal conduit? It was a uh, PEC conduit. I wonder how they locate it. Do they have metal? Hey, he has a trace. That's a metal oh. metal wire, so oh. you can locate it. So to make sure that whoever locate, they have now the the right uh, uh, location for the fiber. It happened in March. We finally, and it's been like five months since we had the incident, and we've been sending more more wastewater to Edgerton than what they actually, that, that we are obligated. So we've been 
they ask, we, they charge us about two dollars thirty-eight per thousand gallons. We are committed to send them one hundred fifty thousand gallons per day, per month. Oh, sorry, one hundred fifty thousand gallons per day. So that we're getting a little extra because we send them more more wastewater because they have no way of controlling the the, uh, the amount going to Edgerton. What what the fiber does is we have a pipeline, you have a valve. In, in the SCADA system, you can regulate the valve. Without the uh, cable, the valve, we had to guess what was the flow and leave it at that position. So we over pump uh, wastewater to Edgerton, and that costs us more money. But it's up and running now, thanks to uh, Bruce's help. I like seven horsepower, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had to pay for the fiber. We had to pay for the fiber. The whole, uh, the whole project was, not including the labor, was about uh, eight thousand dollars. I can understand paying for the, the cable because we replaced it, we upgraded it. But it sure seems like there should be some liability on the location. But Especially if we set. Right. I mean, yeah, if we're sending information out. Information. Yeah. Okay. Then on the uh, on the water uh, water side, we have the uh, raw water pumps project. Then we have the high service pumps. The high service pump the uh, water from the clear wells to the two storage tanks we have here, or four. So they'll be coming up hopefully next month. And on the electric side, oh, on the wastewater, going back to wastewater again, we uh, put, a, put a RFP for the SCADA replacement that started last year, and we never got around it, so we finally put a RFP for replacing the SCADA system at Kill Creek, which we have an answer by next Friday. And on the electric side, as I reported, or John reported uh, last month, we uh, got uh, the new transformer in. We got the new 161 KB breaker in. We got the two feeders coming off T2 transformer. Uh, about probably now a month ago now, probably less than a month ago, we energized T2 and put the two new feeders in service. Right, six hours after we did that, we, uh, we got a differential on T2, so we tripped the circuit. The problem, of, and this is a reoccurring problem, we had it since 2014. Some people believe it's related to the fire in 2014. Some, some of the old people, some of the... Uh, the raccoons? To the raccoons. Oh, man. Some of the old... Uh, Operators like Dave said, no, that came when they transferred the transformer from sub-2 to sub-1. So right now we're trying to verify that all the wiring is correct, all the terminations are going to the right place, and uh, we're working on that right now. Once we get the new cables pulled and terminated, we'll go ahead and uh, energize T2 again. So we done a electrical test last year. We couldn't find any problem with the transformer. And you, we took some oil samples to uh, to see if there's any gases in the oil that will indicate you have a uh, your insulation is degrade, degradating or you have a some kind of a short or arc inside the transformer. So the results are negative. So. We're still looking, but I'm not going to energize T2 until I have found the uh, root cause. The last time there was, it tripped, and by five minutes later, there were people coming to the utilities asking what happened. And that's uh, that includes Walmart, Burger King, Trade Net, Coleman, so there's a...
feet out there. And on the uh, transformer one, it's in place. It has been uh, checked out. But right now, there was another project was uh, changing the uh, relay protection on unit one and two. So that is what is uh, pulling us behind that project. So we cannot energize T1 until we have the relay protection in place. So. We were supposed to be finished by the end of May, so now it looks it'll be around by mid-August. One thing that we, well, at least I found out that during the years there were made, there were there was there were a lot of changes made on the wiring and very poor record keeping. So that's causing some of the problems, trying to trace where the cables are going. Speaking of record keeping, how are we doing on uh, NERC and FERC? NERC, FERC. Yeah. How are we? We have a, uh, this year uh, we hired a compliance engineer. His name is uh, Matt Panzer. Yep. So he's, uh, He's the, the one responsible. He works with KMEA to make sure that we are in compliance with the uh, NERC and FERC uh, uh, requirements. So he's the one uh, managing that right now. And have we been running the generators any? No, because right now T1 is not in service. Oh, right, because he wants to go. Never mind. Now, on the NERC and FERC, going back to NERC and FERC, there's an audit next year. And um, Neil Rowland told me some of the documentation has been misplaced. So we need to somehow find where that document, documentation is. So maybe we need to go back to uh, the previous uh, staff and ask them if they have records or where to find it. So he thinks that might be a, a uh, I think the last, the last time I remember talking about it a bunch, I think Darren had scrambled to find a bunch of documentation and put it all together then. So we're planning to uh, reach uh, Darren and ask him. Yeah. Because there's some pieces of KME doesn't have it and we don't have it. I can't imagine how KMEA would And that's basically all, all I have for this month's meeting. Other questions, comments, commissioner? No. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion, Waldman's second. Learned. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.